Let us begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great blessing that your holy word is to us, to our faith, to our life. As we continue to study uh, the book of Acts, uh, given through uh, St. Luke, uh, or we study the book of Luke and Acts as given through the hand of St. Luke. We ask that you continue to bless our time together. Help us to come to a greater understanding and appreciation of your holy word um, and help it strengthen our faith so that we may, as we talked about in the sermon this morning, cling ever more uh, to your son uh, in trust and faith uh, who was crucified for our behalf. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, friends, so last week we were talking about the announcement of St. John the Baptist's birth by the angel Gabriel, uh, and this week we're going to shift forward to the announcement of Jesus' birth to Mary also by the angel Gabriel. Last week I had um, frustratedly failed to provide you with uh, this little chart here on the back. Uh, I told you that uh, this is what I had called a chiasm. I had written that on the board. Um, this was so. This is of last week's stuff, um, not this week's. But the 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 pattern is the exact same for the Annunciation of Jesus' birth. So if you look at that real quick, uh, Caleb, um, it starts out, and you get these these patterns A, B, C, D, and E. The way these chiasms work is the center of the chiasm. The center is the most important. And I kind of talked about that last week, but I said that you would, you would be easier for you to see and understand if you actually saw it. Um, so the announcement by the angel Gabriel of John's birth is the most important thing. And we, get, we go into this, and then we come out of it basically with mere... Uh, mere items. So if you look at A, you see Zechariah performing his priestly liturgical duty. And then A1 is Zechariah fulfills the days of his liturgical service, given in 123. So you get him in, in the temple and then fulfilling his time at the temple. The next step in, Zechariah enters into the sanctuary to burn the incense is B. B1, Zechariah comes out, letting the people know that he has seen a vision inside the sanctuary. So you get these mere things, this movement towards and then back out of the central theme. Does anybody remember last week when we were talking why? Why does Luke write that way? Not only explain, yeah, very good, explaining to people that aren't Jewish. So he's got to explain and give more pieces of inf information, but he's also explaining to people who don't have the ability just to pull out a notebook and write things down like we do. It's, it's a people that may or may not be able to even read. And thus, they were a, a people that heard the stories and remembered them. Uh, people of ancient days, their memories would put us to shame. Even those of us that, that are good at remembering things, which obviously my... My admission this morning in the, uh, at the beginning of the sermon, not remembering things well, whether selectively or uh, unintentionally. Um, even when we can remember things well, these folks would have put us to shame because they had to remember all things. Now, certainly they don't have, oh, it's 945, I got a meeting in 10 minutes, right? Uh, it's not, not that type of culture either. But one of the big things uh, that these chiasms are used for are to help people remember. The other thing that we talked about was, is what is known as step parallelism. So you have the chiasms that is this form inside uh, the announcement of St. John's birth and the announcement of Jesus' birth. But then even the announcements between Jesus and John follow the same pattern. This is called step parallelism, where they have, you have two different characters and the information is, is organized in the exact same way to help you remember that these are the two central figures in, in the Gospel of Luke. Any questions on those things before we actually get into what we're going to talk about today? If you've got Bibles in front of you, which hopefully you all have, if you don't, I've got plenty of extras over here. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 1. That's going to be on our Bibles here. That's going to be page uh, 1012 and 1013. 
1,013. We're picking up at verse 26. This is where uh, the angel Gabriel uh, comes to announce the birth of Jesus. So if we just glance here quickly at verses 26 through 28, who can tell me what we actually know about Jesus from these ver- or from uh, sorry, what do we know about Mary from these verses? So 26 through 28. Yep, she's a virgin and she's she's engaged, right? So we know those two things. Anything else? Descendant of David, those are good points. But that's pretty much it, isn't it? <laughs> that, that we have a descendant of David, which is important. Why is that important? Yeah, yeah. So um, the the descendantship between the line that is protected in the Old Testament prophets are or to come from the line of David. Now, is it Mary that comes from the line of David? No, it's Joseph. It's Joseph. There we go. Um, it's also believed that Mary was also a descendant of David. Um, but remember, uh, the societies went through the husbands uh, in terms of descendancy. So that's why Luke focuses on, on this. Um, so she's, she's engaged, and she's a virgin. So that's really the... The main information, we do have one other piece of information. Um, she's highly favored, so we, we, we do know that, that, that God has looked upon favor. But in terms of a historical fact, we know one other thing. She and Elizabeth are related. She and Elizabeth are related, right? Um, that's, that's very, you guys are picking up all of the things that I didn't pick up on. Um, I'll just give it to you. Angel goes to Nazareth. She's in Nazareth. So we know exactly where she's at uh, uh, as, a, as a historical fact. So Nazareth in Galilee is where Mary is. This is where she's engaged. And this is where Gabriel comes. So then we go into to number two on her sheets. And Doug... Does Gabriel go there because she's there? Or, or if she wasn't there, would it be somebody else? Was it forecasted that Gabriel was going to go directly there? So, so it's, it's, there? it's, um, that's a great question, Jennifer. Very good question. Um, what we have is that question tries to make a distinction between God's foreknowledge, so the fact that God knows everything, uh, and what he causes to happen. So you always have this, this weird dynamic between, since God knows everything, does he cause everything to happen? And if we say yes, that he causes everything to happen, then we no longer have any free will at all. Um, so that's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, I think that it is certainly because we have Old Testament prophecies that point to Nazareth, particularly. This is part of, part of that prophecy and that fulfillment. Um, that Mary and Joseph are from Nazareth, and that they return to Nazareth. Because we will see later in this that that it is a point that they fulfill a prophecy that Jesus is a Nazarene. Um, And so those things are are equally important. Um, So it's good good to keep those things in mind. Um, The fact that that she is highly favored, that she is from Nazareth, uh, makes her... I can't answer for the mind of God to know whether he causes this thing to happen to fulfill the prophecy um, or if human free will plays plays a role in those things. I like to believe that human free will does uh, because one of the things that uh, we would find out from one of the other gospel writers in regards to Joseph was that he was planning on divorcing his wife quietly, right? And, and, God intervenes by sending Gabriel back to say, no, 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 this isn't what it looks like, right? This is, this is a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a likely story, right? Doesn't every, every uh, woman who gets pregnant out of wedlock claim to have the son of God in her womb? Uh, but the angel comes and warns, uh, right? So, so there is free will in that, right? If, if Joseph was allowed to exercise his full will, Mm-hmm. Yes, so this is, when we talk about 
yeah, when we talk about attributes of God, essential attributes of God, one of them is that he's all-powerful. Uh, part of that, what we call, uh, do you remember the word? Omnipotence, right? Yes, very good, Kayla. Omnipotence of God uh, is that God is not bound by space and time. He exists outside of it. He created space and time, right? And so, uh, so he is beginning and end all at the same time. This is when scripture uh, tries to talk about these things, it will say, you know, uh, a thousand years are like the blink of an eye to God or a day to God. This is what we're trying to describe in human terms, meaning that God actually exists outside of space and time, which makes it all the more wonderful that he chooses to enter space and time in the person of Jesus. Once again, showing the depths of God's love in these things, which is great. Did I answer your question, Jennifer? Okay, good. Um, uh, and number two, then, uh, we have the angel that comes to Mary. And just as Jennifer pointed out, that Mary is higher, or Judy, one of the two of you pointed out, that Mary is highly favored by the Lord. Uh, women play a huge lo- role. A lot of times Christianity gets accused of being over-patriarchal. And in one sense, there is part of this in that uh, headship is given by God. Um, we, won't, we won't get in, into that, otherwise we won't go into these things. But women play a very, very important role in Scripture. Are we crunching the plate, kid? Yes. <laughs> uh, women play a, a huge role in, in Scripture. Uh, and I've given you some citations here um, of other women. So during this week, if you want to look those up in, in Genesis 16, Judges 13, and even Luke 131, we can look at that because we're already here. Luke 131, you will be filled with child. So Mary is playing a large role uh, in, in there. Um, Hagar... Uh, which is in the Old Testament in Isaiah 7, um, is given, we will look at this one. So if you go to Isaiah 7, 14, I'll give you a page number real quick, if I don't pass it. So if you remember, those that were in our Isaiah study, uh, chapter 7 is a very important chapter in, in, uh, in Scripture. Um, 681, 682 are the page numbers for Isaiah. Uh, chapter 7, does anybody remember what's, what the big deal with chapter 7 in Isaiah is? Emmanuel. This is God with us, right? Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a child, and you will call him Emmanuel. So chapter 7 is Emmanuel, the Emmanuel chapter. Um, in 14, uh, this is Hagar who is being told these things. Uh, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And so you have these words given. um, And so Mary fulfills this very prophecy, right? In 127 uh, of Luke and 131, we find out that Mary is a virgin that conceives a son. For those that were with me in the Isaiah study, what it, do you remember what we talked about in regards to this verse? Uh, who it pointed to, uh, possibly, at the time of Isaiah? <clears throat> so the, the son of Ahaz, if you remember King Ahaz, is who Isaiah is talking about in chapter 7, um, makes a deal because he's scared that the Assyrians are going to come in and attack. And so the prophet Isaiah comes and says, hey, this is going to happen. Uh, the son... Hezekiah, who restores the worship life to to the sanctuary, to the temple. Um, Hezekiah is the one that is often associated with also fulfilling this portion of the prophecy. This is the really hard part about prophecy in Scripture, is a lot of times you have different layers of prophecy. So you'll have someone who fulfills that in a... Uh, in a kind of a shallow way at the time of the prophet, but then it ultimately points to Jesus who fully fulfills Would you say the prophecy. Would foreshadowing of like Hezekiah? Yeah, so, it, yeah, and, and very good, Tanner. That's a great point. Uh, thank you. Um, we call this foreshadowing in, in literary works, right? If an if a author g- drops some hints about what's to come. Yeah. In Scripture, we call this typology, a type or an archetype. The archetype is Jesus. A lot of times we talk about Jesus as being the, you know, the, the true David. David as he should have been. 
D or David was a type of Jesus. David uh, had the favor of the Lord. David was faithful in many things, but certainly not faithful in all things. Um, and so David was a type of Christ, pointing to Christ. Uh, doesn't fulfill Christ all the way, but points to him. That's, that's right, son. This is very exciting to Killian, my 11-month-old. Oh, hey, you, you should be looking at the, the words of Jesus and not flirting with pretty ladies, young man. You are your father's son. That's right. See, he's at church. This is, this is exactly where you go to find good, faithful women. You go to church. I, I, I know, but he's practicing. Amber will be a type. To bring this full circle, will be a type of Killian's future wife. Someone faithful that comes to church. Well done. Uh, and so we get this, these types that point to who Jesus is. And in the time of Isaiah, this was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was faithful, returned temple worship to the people of Israel. Uh, and then at the, the end of that, certainly, who epitomizes temple worship but Christ. Where he is, he is our temple. He even says this, and he will say this later in the gospel, right? That destroy this temple, meaning his body, and I will rebuild it in three days. So you get all of these different sections of scripture that are all pointing to Jesus, and it's wonderful. Uh, the Old Testament can also help us shed light on who Mary is. Uh, in the Old Testament, Israel is often spoken of as a woman. This shouldn't surprise us, right? The church is known as the new Israel. And how do we refer to the church? The bride of Christ, right? He, he is our bridegroom. And so we will get both of these. Uh, in, in regards to the Old Testament as... Uh, referred to as woman. The, the Old Testament, this happens uh, quite a bit in Isaiah's gospel, that the, the Israel is called the daughter of Zion. Um, and then also we get this, this marital imagery also in the Old Testament. So many of the prophets speak of uh, Israel as being the wife of the Lord. Now, She's the unfaithful wife of the Lord oftentimes, uh, especially in Isaiah's gospel. And yet God remains faithful. And we are told time and time again in Old Testament uh, allusions that, uh, that God will come and uh, reclaim his bride. Uh, so God promises the Messiah will come to his bride Israel. And so in a sense, Mary becomes the fulfillment of Israel. She becomes the epitome of Israel. She is the new daughter of Zion. The new daughter of Zion through whom God will bring forth this Messiah, this promised son. Uh, and then marital imagery is going to be prominent in all of the Gospels and even in St. Paul. Um, and it pictures Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. So from this perspective, then, we have Jesus, who is God in the flesh, who has come to reclaim his bride. Uh, we're also pictured as the church waiting for that bridegroom. Uh, this is going to be at the end of Luke's gospel uh, in chapter 25. And this is going to suggest that virginity, especially in the culture of Jesus today, uh, the church holding herself apart from the world, not marrying or lusting after the things of the world. We are supposed to be the pure bride of Christ. Um, and he is the one that makes us pure. And so we have then Mary as the virgin mother in the role of the church, the virgin bride of Christ. Uh, the New Testament also helps shed light uh, on Mary as well. We have the analogy of Mary representing the church in Revelation 12. In, the, in Revelation chapter 12, there's the woman who gives birth like Mary to the son who rules over all nations. This is Revelation 12:5. Uh, and then after her son ascends to his throne uh, beside God, also in Revelation 12, 5, that woman, like the church, is attacked by the devil, as are the children of the, the woman, us. We are the children of the church. Uh, and that comes about in Revelation 12, 17. Therefore, uh, the mother is of God's son, and God's sons are also attacked by the devil during this kind of sojourn uh, during our lives. So you have the entirety of Scripture that kind of bears witness to, to Mary, who she is, what she, what she, well, what God, that's probably a better way to put it, what God accomplishes through her. Um, this is why even in Lutheranism we venerate Mary. We don't worship her, 
But we do talk about her as being highly favored. One of the things that we do here uh, um, at Trinity is we celebrate all the Marian feasts. We talked about the presentation of our Lord uh, at the beginning of February. But the other thing that we talked about was the purification of Mary during that time where she goes. Uh, we will celebrate the visitation uh, later on this spring when the angel comes to Mary. This exact thing that we're talking about, we're going to talk about that. Um, uh, and so we, we celebrate these various milestones in the life of the church, also celebrating Mary. So there is a reason that Mary has a high place in the church. Now, we don't need to pray to her because Jesus teaches himself that we can call God our Father and go directly to him. So we don't need any other intercessor other than Christ. And yet Mary is a wonderful example of faith. And we're going to talk about that more today here uh, about the example of faith Questions thus far? Everybody kind of... Jennifer. Do they come to church who spoke about the people didn't understand the word reading? The people didn't understand the words that they heard. Do they come to church and they say, well, we understand the word, but we don't understand the words that they heard? Or is the Old Testament like that? That Isaiah got the message and he related, but they just didn't understand? understand. You got it. Yeah. Well, clearly they weren't alive when Jesus came. Right. So is it what they taught their children over and over and over again until that happened? Yes. And then it's like a light bulb? Yeah. Hole? Yeah. And then even, even then, right? If you, this is one of the things I love the most about how God has written his word is we are Israel. We are as Christians. I mean, think of how many times that you hear God's word and it doesn't click for you. It goes right over your head. And you, you don't get to hear it, and, or you hear it and you don't understand it, so therefore you can't apply it. But then either another Christian will say something. God willing, hopefully I say something, whether it be in a, in a sermon or in a Bible study, and you go, holy cow, I've never understood that before. And, and that just kind of all comes together and you go, my goodness. Tanner and I uh, have wonderful conversations, usually all day long. Um, and uh, he's one of my best friends. And, and we, we talk, we think about God's word all the time, both of us. And when I see things that I go, oh, I text him and I say, dude, you got to look at this. And when he has those same experiences, so we're constantly edifying each other's faith in that way. And, and I thank God every day that I have a, a, a friend like that. But there have been times where I've tried to explain something and in, in my own, um, in my own failings uh, and, and my abilities to explain, I, I won't. And I'll try hard, but he'll hear something or he'll read something and, and it, that light bulb will happen and he will go, Pastor, it's literally this simple. And I will say, dude, I've been trying to explain that to you for three months. And, and, and I don't get upset about it. I love it. Because that, that I, I wish that I could give him that clarity. But the fact that he gets it in that way. It's okay, Tanner. He does that to me all the time. I, what, I confuse you? Yeah. He does it to me 24-7. The light bulb in my head doesn't always go off. You don't ruminate on God's word 24 hours a day. Do you use Tanner as an example of what you should be doing faithfully? I know. I'm going to be in trouble later, just so you all know. Uh, but no, this but this is exactly what we do, right? It, Maybe that's why we're not supposed to be solitary. That's exactly why we're not supposed to be solitary. This is why the American way of my Bible and I sit at home and I'm good cannot work. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And, and we can't. St. Paul says, how can they hear if no one's there to preach? And how can they preach if no one's there to teach? Preaching and teaching have to go together and it only comes in the body. It only comes in the body. We, we have to do this together. We can't do it by ourselves. You would never, ever, ever go... Gee, I don't feel well today. I'm going to read through this medical manual on my own. Oh, I get it now. I'm good. I'm going to perform surgery on myself. That seems insane, but we do it to our faith. I, I'm, as St. Paul says, I'm pleading with you with tears in my eyes. And I, I know I'm, you, to use church speak, I'm preaching to the choir right now because you're all here. But I have been studying this 
every day, 12 to 15 hours for over eight years. And I know nothing. I know nothing. Yes, I know. I'm all excited, son, and you want me to settle down. But, but, but this is... This is, this is the exact thing that we're fighting in, in America right now, in American Christianity. We believe that faith is this thing that's simply between me and God. And that is so wrong. That is so wrong. Some of you have heard this analogy from me before. We are the body of Christ. If you hit your thumb with a hammer, you cannot look at your thumb and say, that's your problem, I don't want to feel that pain. What happens to one of us happens to all of us, whether good or bad. We are the body, and the body is affected all together. We need each other. And God gives this. this is a, the church is a gift. We screw it up often because our human sinfulness gets in the way. But the church is a gift. When, when things are going wrong in our life, we should be able to depend on the people here at Trinity to come and find us and yank us out of that and bring us back to God. That is who we should be able to depend on. If we cannot depend upon the people here, then things are hopeless for us. That's, that's important for us to realize that we are the, we are the body uh, and that faith is a communal thing. We are a community. This is why we started calling it communion, <laughs> right? It stresses the Lord's Supper has many names. All of them are apt and all of them stress something different, so they're all good. If you listen to my prayers of the church, I use a different name for the Lord's Prayer every week, pretty much. And I do that so that they're constantly before your ears, so that you hear and you are reminded. This week I said Eucharist. We give thanks that our Lord has given his body and blood for us. Yes, we do. Don't shake your head no at me, son. Sinful obstinance, you see that? I love it. Um, but maybe next week I will talk about communion. The fact that when we take Christ into us, literally, we take him into us. We are literally taken into him and into one another. We are united in a way at that altar that we can't experience anywhere else. This is why I tell people that, that this yesterday was the two-year anniversary of my father's death. So it was a real rough morning. I spent about four hours over here crying until I had a headache because I miss my dad so much. Um, and yet, this morning, I took the body and blood of Christ, and I was united with my Lord and with my dad in a way that we we didn't even have here on earth. And my dad and I were as close as we can be. That is a beautiful thing. And God gives us that gift. This is exactly what I'm writing my dissertation on and why I'm trying to finish my doctorate is because I think this is important and we don't talk about it well in Lutheranism. We focus on forgiveness, life, and salvation, and to be sure, those are great. Yes, and I know he's encouraging me to keep going. Uh, we talk about those three, and they are very important. Did he shake his head no? Yeah. yeah. I love you so much, kid. Yeah, he talks to me all through the sermon. Okay. Um, you got me all, all excited. No, it's fine. I... I, I tell people all the time, if I could just take you and, and give you everything that I see after all of my studying, if I could just implant it, you would understand why I get this excited. And you would understand why I cannot fathom anyone could reject this gift. <laughs> I just, I don't understand it. Because the more you study it, the, the depth of our faith as Christians, the depth of the faith that God has given us, is, is, is it's just incredible. It's mind-blowing. Richard. Yes, well, for one, all of my, I, I do save all of my sermons, so if you ever want a copy, you can always get a copy from me. Um, two, they're also on our Facebook page if you ever want to listen to them again. They're there as well, but sometimes you need to read them and hear them. So when, whenever you need, just, just let me know. I will be more than happy to make copies. Okay, back to Luke. <laughs> uh, number four, the angel addresses Mary with this three-part greeting. Let's look at each one of these parts. We'll look at them real quick uh, all together, and then we'll go. Um, so the angel says to her, this is in verse 28, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now what is normally translated here as greetings is really rejoice. Right? So we have rejoice. 
On Palm Sunday, we're going to talk about this very thing. Uh, while all the while, uh, my good friends, the Martins, will be in town uh, for our this Palm Sunday is when we're going to do confirmation, and so we're we're really going to rejoice on Palm Sunday. So I look forward to my daughter uh, Kayla and Ashton Shea also, and then our our friends, the Martins, and and. They will be confirmed in the church, uh, and uh, a couple of them will be given their very first communion on that day, and that'll be a day that we're excited about. Um, On Palm Sunday, the disciples welcomed their king's arrival into Jerusalem by rejoicing, and this once again is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. Uh, Zechariah 9.9 and 3.14 speaks of the daughter of Zion rejoicing that her Savior has come to her. This is exactly what what Palm Sunday does and what Mary is told to do. That her Lord is coming to her and she is to rejoice that her king has come to her. So the first part is rejoice. The second part is favored woman or highly favored here in the, the NIV refers to Mary being the recipient of God's grace. Right? Mary doesn't deserve grace. Um, in the Roman Catholic faith, they teach that Mary was without sin. That uh, Mary remained without sin. Uh, that also Mary uh, remained a virgin. Um, in Lutheranism, we, there's nothing that we see towards that. Um, can I share why they believe yes, that? Yes, you can. It's impo- um, I, do th- I do think it's important. Yes, um, you, you have to always go back to the Old Testament. Correct. The law of Moses was contained in the Ark of the Covenant, mm-hmm. which was a perfect vessel. Perfect vessel. And you are that's absolutely right. Why they, in the New Testament, yeah. Mary is the, perfect the vessel. vessel. Correct. Of Jesus yeah. is not just the law, but the fulfillment. Right. And and so here's the difference. The difference between we we're Lutheranism and Roman Catholicism in this are are trying to do the same thing. We're just going about it two different ways. Roman Catholicism will say that. The ark was the type. Mary is the archetype. And she is thus perfect to be the vessel. Lutherans will say that it wasn't anything inherent in Mary, but when the Holy Spirit overshadows her, the Holy Spirit perfects her. So it's not that Mary was perfect up until the time, because we always focus on the grace of God perfecting us in Lutheranism. And this is why, so it's, it's, we're doing the same thing, but we're doing it in a little bit of a different way, and it leads us to different conclusions, right? So uh, in the Roman Catholic faith, I just talked about this with my, my students at Marquette. Um, they believe that Mary experienced no pain in childbirth. Because she was perfect, and pain in childbirth was a result of sin, they believe that she had no pain in childbirth. It does follow. It is internally consistent. So you can't get mad at them for it, uh, for, for holding those things. Once again, we're trying to do the same thing. We're just doing it in two different ways. Lutherans don't believe that. In fact, we take great comfort in the fact that she gave birth to Jesus in a very natural way. Comfort in that. That any woman in childbirth that feels that pain should, should have a point of connection with the mother of our Lord. Um, Either way, I don't think your salvation is dependent upon either way. I do, I do, I believe obviously the Lutheran, the Lutheran way, um, because I, I find the, the comfort that we get from those from those very things, um, and that is, you took the vessel. That's my next point. Mary does not deserve grace, but is a vessel that is filled up with grace. So just as the Ark of the Covenant was the perfect vessel, even though it was built by human hands, it was sanctified by the fact that God's law was put into it. It was sanctified by the blood that was shed on it, the mercy seat. Um, And it became the vessel for God's grace and forgiveness to the people. So too does our Lord, our Lord's mother, become the vessel that is going to give us the very thing that sheds blood and forgives our sins. Paul. Now you told us what the Roman Catholics believe or what the Lutherans believe. What do some of would the other Protestant uh, religions would they believe the same? Yeah, they're 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 going to be more more apt to believe uh, the Lutheran way um, because most of the Protestant denominations flow from that, but not all of them. Uh, in fact, there's divisions within within Protestantism. Um, Luther, most of you probably don't know this, prayed the Rosary until the day he died. 
Well, to Mary. <laughs> to Mary. Do you pray to Mary or do you pray through Mary? Because so this I is, have yeah. It's not to. It's through, it's yes. Through. Yeah. Please petition for Mary. Correct. And the reason why. I'm not praying to Right. Pray. That, is, that, that is true. That is absolutely true. And, and you're, you're looking at a pastor who carries a rosary and prays oh, wow. it. Okay? Um, but I also, I also, I don't say the Hail Mary. And I don't because if I'm going to ask someone to petition for me, I'm going to Christ, who is called the Great Intercessor. Right. And this um, is who St. Paul tells is us as the Great Intercessor. I think the reason why they emphasize asking for Mary's intercession, asking for the intercession of all the saints, Correct. is for the exact same reason that you ask mm -hmm. the congregation to, to pray. pray for everything. You got it. If there's no difference, it's the same. It, it, is, it is very, very similar. The, the difference lies in the fact that it's not taught well anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not taught well to Lutherans, and it's not taught well to Roman Catholics. A lot of these things are just given. Tradition stops being tradition when it stops being taught. This is our crisis in the church. We've stopped teaching. We took it for granted that people were going to come to church because their parents did and their parents' parents did and their parents' parents' parents did. And we stopped teaching. We really have. Uh, and also, we've, we as congregation members have stopped desiring to be taught. Right? People don't come to Bible study. You saw how full we were in worship this morning. It would be so wonderful if I said, oh, we all got to go downstairs because the, you know, the 60 or 70 that were in worship all came for Bible study. That would be wonderful. That would be a great problem to have. Because in a sermon, you can only do so much. And so if that is the extent of God's word interacting with you, you can only learn so much. And I can't, in a sermon, even though I look at you all and I can see points that maybe came out wrong and are a little confusing, and I can try to correct those on the spot, and oftentimes yeah. I do, yeah. we can't bounce things back and forth like we just did. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have that option in a, in a sermon, right? Otherwise, we'd have a three-hour-long church service, uh, which is fine for me. You all may not like it. Um, well, like the Baptist all day long. <laughs> yeah. There's something to be good, something to be said for that. So this is why we talk about Mary, even in the Hell Mary. Full of grace is the point. Um, and she is full of grace because she bears the one who is grace incarnate. Right? And that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. And one thing that we can agree on with, with our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. The third part that the angel gives is the Lord with you. So this then is becomes a series of statements about the presence of God in Luke's gospel with his people. This is the, also the connection with chapter 7 in Isaiah. Emmanuel means God with us, right? Rejoice, you who are highly favored, God is with you. You have in the words themselves these things. If you want to write down some of these other places that focus on this, we're not going to look at them today. But if you want to look at them this week, I think it would be edifying for your faith. So themes uh, in Luke's gospel that emphasizes Christ with his people. You'll find this in chapter 1, verse 66. I'll write them on the board just in case you, you don't hear me well. So chapter 1, verse 66. Chapter 5, verse 34. Chapter 15, verse 31. Chapter 23, verse 43, and chapter 24, verse 29 and 30. Doug, text me and remind me after this so I can actually send you these things. Even though I said I was going to do it last week and I failed. So if you look at those this next week, you will see various places through Luke's gospel where this theme of God with us, specifically in the person of Christ, being with us. Any questions thus far? All right, number five. Uh, just, just to put things in perspective, how, how uh, when, you, when I get off topic, uh, how little we accomplish. There are 12 points I wanted to make today. <laughs> we are on number five. Uh, so elaborating more on the second uh, part of the angel's greeting, highly favored. Let's look quickly at Romans 5. I'll give you a number. Romans chapter 5. Romans. Romans. 
Romans chapter 5, that's on page 1116, and we're going to look at 12 through 21, and I'll just read them real quick. 12 through 21. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment, followed one, uh, the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man through... Uh, just For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, and so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have this through, through the first Adam, sin enters the world, and death comes to all men. But God sends forth Jesus, the second Adam, to his sinful creation to reverse the effects of the first. So a couple of words that dominate and describe in those passages that I just read, if you had to pick out two, what would you say dominate the passages in Romans 5? That's exactly right, Jennifer. And if I can put two words in your mouth and summarize what you just said, grace and gift. Grace and gift. As Eve contained in her womb all of humanity that was doomed to sin. This is what we, when we say that Jesus assumes the human nature, this is what we mean. Now Mary carries in her womb the one who comes by God's grace and who freely gives God's grace to all who receive it. So you have grace and gift here in the womb of Mary, in the person of Jesus, who is God's grace incarnate and gives God's gr uh, free gift of reconciliation through Jesus. So grace and gift are incarnate in the person of Jesus. He is God's grace and he is the gift. Uh, going back then to Luke 1 uh, in verses 31 through 33. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. What does this sentence mean? That sin is not taken into account when there is no law? Yeah, so before, so you have the period of time before, after Adam, before God gives his law to Moses. Mm -hmm. It's not that sin didn't exist, but if we don't have law to act as a mirror to show us that sin, this is what St. Paul is saying, right? Um, if I never, if I never tell, tell my beautiful daughter, Kayla, that lying is wrong, if I never tell her that, she doesn't know that it's wrong, right? She's going to do it because she is, by nature, sinful and unclean, right? If you've ever raised small children, you know, even from the time they're the youngest, let's say you go in to cook dinner, and you come out, and there's a mess, and you go, who made this mess? Not me. Not me. That's exactly right. Right? So, and, and never did you set them down and tell them, this is how you lie. 
You've never taught them that, and yet, by instinct, they do it. But if you, if you never tell them... Well, we discussed a lot, tattling yes. and telling. Yes. Big difference. Yes. Yes. There's a yes. Yes. Tattle. Tattle tells just so they get the punishment. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That my self righteousness demands that they suffer for this, right? Um, And there's a big difference between the two. That's exactly right. But that's what that line means, right? The law shows us our sin. Yep. Because it shows us God's perfection. Yep, that's exactly right. And this is why when, when, when I kneel, and most of you have heard this before, um, but for those that haven't, when I kneel before I go to, to, to take the pulpit, I pray for you all. I pray that God's law would come through my sermon and convict you and kill you. And then I pray that God's gospel would restore to life what His law has been brought what his laws brought low. And then I, I actually believe in a third use of the law. I then pray that God through his Holy Spirit given to you in your baptisms would align your wills with his and allow you to love his law and use it to guide your lives. All right? So we run the whole gamut between convicted by the law, justified by Christ and him alone, and then sanctified trying to do those gifts of love that we talked about in the sermon today. That, that those gifts, though, only flow from faith. Yeah. All right, uh, number six, and this will probably be where we stop for today. Uh, look at that. Uh, three lessons into it, and we're already behind. Um, no, it, I never get that worried about getting behind because there's no such thing as being behind as long as learning is occurring. Um, so in uh, Luke 1, verses 31 through 33... Gabriel makes clear to Mary and other believers who this child is. In 31, we get his name. We get Jesus. Jesus means that Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh saves. God saves. Right? So that's who this this child is. It is God saving. In verse 32, we get the words great and, and the title son of the most high. If you remember, John was also great. Right, we're talking about hi, buddy. We get that that uh, that chiasm or that step parallelism, where John is called great and Jesus is called great, but Jesus is given a second qualifier, the Son of the Most High. Uh, and then in verses thirty or verse thirty three, we are told that Jesus is the King. So in those three verses, you have three qualifiers that tell exactly who this child is that Mary will carry. Um, Beautiful and wonderful. Questions on six on any of those three titles? Questions on anything that we have covered thus far? Let me make a little note here to where we'll pick up next week. Wonderful. Great discussions today, friends. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. If there are no other questions, we will finish with the Lord's Prayer. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful week, friends. We'll see you on Wednesday for probably most of you. Tuesday, if you're coming to uh, the Bible study on Tuesday night.